about three years ago, I decided to take the leap of faith and go write all my USMLE exams, take part in the match, give all the damn interviews, and I finally matched into my dream residency. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. If you're new here, my name's Manik. I'm your friendly neighborhood doctor. I reside here in the United States and I'm pursuing a residency at a university program. And I'm gonna spill the beans in this video on whether USMLE is truly worth it as a licensing exam based upon the past eight months of my experience as a resident doctor here. So when I was starting my USMLE exam preparation, little did I know that this exam was harder to pass than a kidney stone. I mean, I do not kid you, the amount of preparation that goes into writing the step one, step two, and step three is just insane. Leave alone like how tough these exams are, and not only that, how long do they go? Step one's about eight hours, step two CK is nine hours, and step three is 16 hours in total. That's a huge amount of hours I'm talking about. And Let's add on to this the complexity of the whole math system because it doesn't matter alone if you just get a good score. What also matters is your personality, your ability to network with people. And that's very much unlike the system where I was from, originally India, where if you had good marks and a good rank, you were able to get into any dream specialty that you wanted to. But USMLE did not follow the same rules. Here, you had to have personality. Here, you have to craft a CV with professional experiences, research experiences, volunteer experiences. And then, even after you're done with that, you have to give interviews and if, if you're done with all of this process and you perform well, you still might not match, which is crazy, right? So the whole process of this was very daunting and I still took the leap because I always wanted to live the American dream. And I'm gonna tell you the pros and cons of like whether this process has bore fruit for me or not and whether or not USMLE truly is worth it. Provided that we have to spend about here and there $20,000 to even get into a residency, have a chance of getting into a residency. Does the salary of a first year resident cover for the $20,000 expense? My answer to that is yes. So here in my residency, I'm paid about $64,000 and this is before taxes for the whole year. $64,000 that I'm getting at the moment, like in my first year, will five to 7% near about that much increase in the next year. So I'll be making more like $67,000, $68,000, which I might use to move to a better apartment, if you may. After taxes, it comes to about $51,000 per year. And if you think about it, monthly salary, it's about close to $4,250 in total for everything. That salary is more than enough to cover your expenses that you occur during the whole journey. Not only that, it allows me to buy my own car and it's a really good car it's a Hyundai Elantra I find it more than into even like you know sp spend on a good apartment the one that I'm currently living in also any kind of insurance is also pretty easily covered by my salary and I'm actually able to save about two thousand five hundred dollars on an average per month and I invest that into index funds Vanguard is my favorite one so that it actually gives back more money this salary that I'm talking about the sixty four thousand dollars per year this does not include moonlighting moonlighting is when a resident doctor who's mostly more more often than not a pgy2 that is second year resident works in other places other than the residency there's two types of moonlighting that we can talk about the first moonlighting is rural moonlighting where the resident doctor who's more often than not a pgy2 or a head they work in different hospitals and they can make money hourly however you need a green card for this if your hospital sponsors a visa that gets hard that's where in comes the second part which is internal moonlighting internal moonlighting is when the resident doctor works in their own hospital not during their resident hours but outside of those residency hours and you can get paid extra for that as a matter of a fact one of my seniors who was in the fourth year he was working an external moonlighting job and he was getting paid five hundred dollars per hour just for moonlighting which is just insane like at, at just a pg you, you know residency level all in all the amount of money that you make here is just short of 
wow i mean once you become an attending this money figure even like then goes to a six figure money figure for the residency that i'm pursuing psychiatry you can make easily over three hundred thousand dollars but if you choose to work in community hospitals you can make even four hundred fifty thousand dollars that's one of the offers that i'm aware of that was made to one of my senior residents um what about other benefits? So as a resident, every year you get a CME money, which helps a lot. So CME money is given by the ACGME, which is Accreditation Council of Graduate Medical Education, which basically funds all residencies all across America. And this money is meant to be spent towards books. If you're taking the US Family Step 3 exam, you can use it for that. You can also use it for buying any iPads or sometimes residency programs also allow you to take uh, buy laptops from that. I get about $600 for the first year, but this increases over the next years. Next is free food. Some residencies will give you a badge which has a certain amount of money on it per month or per quarter that you can use to buy food from the cafeteria. I get about $150 per quarter, which barely suffices. But again, like my salary is very high compared to the region I'm in. So I'm able to compensate with that. Other residencies, what they do is they basically give you free food. This is like what you will see a lot of the times in internal medicine residencies where, you know, like they, they get free food because they're working the floors and it's, it's a lot of hard work. So you get free bake pass, free food and that taken care of. Next, let's, let's talk about schedule. You know, like is, is the residency work hectic or is it chill? The truth of the matter is it really depends upon the kind of rotation you are doing and then the residency that you're pursuing. The residency that I'm pursuing again, psychiatry, is a relatively relaxed residency. I generally work 8 to about 5 p.m. every day, five days a week. The weekends are off for us, except when it's when there's a call. So if I work from 8 to 5, right, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., I'm working about 9 hours a day and 5 days a week would be 45 hours a week. But to this, you should add the call time. So we do short and long calls. Short call is you work from 5 to 10 p.m. covering the night. When you go to second year, that's when you have 24 hour calls where you work from 8 a.m. on the first day to the 8 a.m. the second day and that's generally longer but all in all like i'm working no more than like 55 hours to 60 hours a week which uh, according to me is pretty relaxed i get time to go to the gym i get enough time to sleep about like seven to eight hours i get enough time to go on dates i get enough time to go out in nature hike do whatever the f fun activity i want to do saturday sunday is free for me i, I like this residency right talking about cutting edge medicine the second big thing about like being a resident here is the chance to immerse yourself in the cutting edge of medicine really because especially when you're working in a university program you get to work with leaders in their fields people who are literally engineering the second thing you you'll also notice here is the emr systems i mean this is revolutionary stuff think about basically documentation that you have in the hospital in paperwork form and just uploading it online into a cloud-based data for the whole hospital and then having the ability to command f or control f and search through that data organize that data Let's talk about like the utility of such EMR systems. So the first utility you can think of is, let's think of a patient, Mr. Brian, right? Who's a 50 year old male. And this patient has a past medical history of cardiac issues, heart attacks and whatnot. And he presents to us in our ED. Now, because of the EMR system, if this patient was ever seen by any of the hospitals that our university hospital has acquired, we'll have the access to data for that patient. Even if that is not true, we can ask other hospitals which have seen the patient to transfer their calls to us. What this allows is when we see the patient from minute zero, right? Like minute one, minute zero, you know everything about the patient, their past medical history. Are they using any drugs? What's their social history? Do they live alone? Do Like how can we help with placement? And the best of all, their medications. You know 
from A to Z what medications they're getting from their pharmacy in real time. And that is, I think, so valuable when you are thinking about a plan for this patient and saves you so much time because you don't have to repeat the whole process of asking them the history again. It helps you to arrange follow-up because then you know, like you can set up an appointment and it's there in the EMR. You can also see if they're taking their medications, dispensing it from the pharmacy because you'll also get the updates in the EMR. Lastly, this also helps a lot in research because once I have so much patient data online, right, like tons and tons of patient data, I can now use this patient data, you know, disconnect all the patient identifiers from this data and then I can use it for research, basically case control research and see like what factors like let's say correlate with a certain disease, what's the association. So that's that I thought was revolutionary in regards to EMR. Now talking about how's the education here. The education you get as a resident doctor, I, I think couldn't like in no words would be short of extraordinary. Basically you get to first of all learn from the best in the world number one number two you're also learning from phds because at, le at least if you think about university programs they have phd doctors as well as phd staff who know research and who know how to e evaluate the latest evidence how to evaluate primary literature directly from pubmed and then present the data to you in a really simple form so you're always learning what's the up and new coming treatment for a certain disease one such instance i can remember of is using cgrp drugs anti-cgrp drugs like ubrevi for migraines which i never heard of before for my didactics i have didactics about once a week and during these didactics phd doc or PhD professors gave us lectures. We have journal club as well where other residents in my residency like including me we present our presentation on a certain topic that interests us. One certain instance I can remember of is using deep brain stimulation for refractory major depression and its efficacy which was given by one of our fourth years which was which had a lot of insight and he was able to dissect the primary literature and present all of that to us and actually I, I gained some clinical understanding of whether I should do that with my patients. Next of all, you get access to amazing softwares like UpToDate, Diana Med. You get access to library, which basically has every book in the world for free. You can read it for free. You get access to gen journals, like all the journals in the world about all the journals for free, which really helps when you are like going through residency, you can look up anything and not worry about subscriptions in this regard. Carrier advancement is another big deal here because the level of carrier advancement you can have here is just not possible elsewhere in the world. So let's think about my residency psychiatry. So after psychiatry, there's just so many pathways to take. There's consolidation psychiatry where you deal, which, which is basically the intersection of medicine and psych, where you deal with medically ill patients who have psychiatric comorbidities and really try to address those comorbidities. Oncopsychiatry is another example of this when like, for example, oncopsychiatry where patients who have a cancer diagnosis and a psychiatric comorbidity such as depression that might be stemming from that cancer, you get to address that as a consolation psychiatry in oncopsychiatry. Then there's child and adolescent psychiatry where you get to deal with and learn about how to get to deal with the patients in the child and adolescent group. There's forensic psychiatry where you deal with criminals. There's geriatric psychiatry where you deal with people aged, patients aged 60 and above. There's just a whole plethora. And that's just for psychiatry. Imagine the other fields, the amount of career advancement you can have. The next thing I want to talk about is hierarchy. In India, I experienced hierarchical systems which led to bullying. Basically, the head of department would be bullying the professors who would be bullying the residents who would like and the senior residents would be bullying the junior residents. This you would not see here because of how strict the ethical policy is. If somebody is found to like discrim discriminate with people based upon their position, you can be kicked out and that's why that keeps people in line. Most of like my professors, my program director, they're extremely friendly people. Nobody misbehaves with you here. Everybody's super friendly. They talk to you like friends and it feels like you're, you're a part of a big family where nobody's bullying each other and basically everyone's supporting each other. So what are the other pros after residency? The first pro that you definitely get is the salary. The salary is six figures. Um, 
And I mean, like after that, after getting a six figure salary, like $300,000 or even like, you know, more, if you're willing to work in rural areas or if you're willing to work in community hospitals, like $450,000, $500,000, you can jump to that, especially in my field. If, if you're in neurosurgery, it's a million dollars. If you have private practice, there's no cap to the amount of money you can make. But what this allows is you stop thinking about money as much because money ceases to exist because you already have so much of it and you're now literally practicing medicine for the fun of it. You'll make so much money in your first, second, third year that money like doesn't matter anymore, which I think is the way I want to live. I don't, I don't want to think about money when I'm like 10 years from now. I just don't want it to be in the in any equation in my head. And I think that helps. Secondly, you get a global license to practice medicine almost anywhere in the world. So this is one, one of the reasons that like you get a global license is because US residencies is one of the most valuable residencies all across the world based on how tough it is and how comprehensive it is in covering the basic tenets of a certain speciality and how advanced it is as well. I can practice back in India and then I can practice in Singapore, the Middle East, New Zealand, Australia, you name it, right? Most countries would allow me to practice there after uh, getting done with my residency here. If you're into travel, this is a big one. Cons. So the cons that come with this process are also not small. The first con that I experienced was my first year of residency. So this year was incredibly overwhelming. First of all, you're moving to a whole new country with its whole new culture, a totally different culture, speaking in a different language that you were used to. Not only that, you are, you know, getting an apartment, not like you're not familiar with the whole process of it. That, that can be uncomfortable. Getting a car, getting your driver's license was like my driver, getting a driver's license is a big process. And when you like, especially, and all, all of this gets even more complicated if you don't have a credit score. When I moved there, I had zero credit. So I wasn't able to buy a car on because nobody would give it to me, right? There are programs that do that. There's Volkswagen and has a physician's program, but like that car was a bit more expensive. So I used the cash that I'd saved before to buy myself a car. But uh, yeah, that, that's a big one. Not having a credit score, go, just, just marching into this country, <laughs> having no idea of how the culture is going to be like and then just just it's just like jumping into a cold pool but that pool is frozen that's how i would describe like my first year of residency beyond this when you're in the hospital it's a whole new system the insurance system the electronic medical record system how people interact here is totally different from what i saw in my home country the second con of the whole process i think is the expenses so your assembly is not a cheap journey it's twenty thousand dollars and that does not guarantee you a residency spot even if you have the best scores in the world even if you have the best interview skills in the world if luck doesn't favor you you're screwed man and that's that's a big deal for a lot of people twenty thousand dollars is not a small amount I was lucky to have made this in my college. I had other jobs. My parents also supported me. So I wasn't that worried about it, but I can definitely see this, this really upsetting a lot of people. But here's the deal. If you can go ahead with the uncertainty of the whole process, and if you do match, you need to consider that you will be an American doctor, which is probably one of the best professions in the world because of the level of medicine you're practicing the amount of money you're making and also the freedom that you have like in time like based upon the time that you're given and the job that you choose the third caveat of the whole process would be the green card process especially if you're an indian so if you look at the green card line if i want to get a green card right now without any eb1 which is extraordinary pathway or o1 visa category that like all both of these require extensive amounts of research and like being an authority in a field which I'm not. If, if you don't have that as an Indian, it, the green card line is about 11 years and that's a big <laughs> deal because if you don't have a green card, you're limited in a lot of ways. For example, if I don't have a green card, I cannot work anywhere else here in America, in any other hospital of my choosing. 
my hospital has to sponsor me a visa would, which would be a J1 or H1B visa during this time. Currently, I'm on a J1 visa. It's a one year visa. And during this process, once I'm done with residency, I have to do a two year home bond where I have to go back to my home country for about two years to serve there. Because again, this is an exchange visa. They are exchanging me working here as a resident and gaining for, for my country, also gaining a resident who has more educational experience and, and like can bring the educational knowledge of America back to India. But there's a way to bypass this, which is the three year rural exemption. I can bypass the two year home bond by working here for three years in a rural area. And that is a limitation if you want to live in an urban setting. Not only that, like during this whole time, while I'll be working in, in a rural area, I cannot apply for green card, even if I get married to a US citizen. After you're done with either the peer bond or you're done with the three year exemption, you can then work on an H1B visa and it would take 11 years, which is a lot of time, right? The other way to go around this is some hospitals do sponsor H1B visa, but again, this is rarer and more limited towards internal medicine and psychiatry residencies, but not all of them do as well. And if you're done, you get H1B visa, you can apply for a green card. Again, the line is still 11 years if you're an Indian. If you are from other countries like Turkey, it's two or three years after you're done with the J1 waiver or the rural the, the rural exemption. That that to me, like this visa limitations and that I, that I cannot work in the setting of my choosing is, is a big con. Fourthly, leaving your country behind. Like, you know, there's something special that you have with your country, the culture that binds all of you together, right, in your home country. And you're leaving that um, and taking this immersion into a whole new culture which is scary, overwhelming, and breaks some people. I, and, and it also causes social isolation. When I was here for the first two or three months, did not, I had a roommate, but I did not have any friends, like best friends, I would say, which I had so many of them in India. My parents were again left back in India. It's hard to bring them here as well based upon the visa processes. So you're very isolated here unless you have family who lives here. For, and this isolation is, you know, limited to mostly your first year. After first year though, you'll make friends. But again, the, the uh, leaving that culture scape behind of your country is a painful process for many. And then some people never get over it. But I think I will get over that because I, I think about myself as a world-centric person, a citizen of the world. I, I do have something special with India, but again, something special with America as well. And I want to travel the world. So that, that's just me. All right, guys, thank you for watching. If you like this video, please do not forget to give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you in the next video.